What's going on, y'all? So let's What's going on, y'all? So we are back again. Ugh, I told y'all this lightning, this lighting is just a horrible mess. It's because the sunlight coming in, and then it's not that much light up in here. Oh, it's just a mess. It's just a mess. Okay, we'll deal with it. We'll deal with it. All right, I'll get it fixed. Okay. But anyway, so we are back for, like I said, the episode review for The Shy. This is season two, episode seven, um, A Blind Eye. Okay. And so basically, this episode. We surprisingly didn't get anything from the kids. We got an episode, I mean, a, a scene with Kevin, you know, going over there to Brandon's house, getting his hair, you know, um, lined up and faded or whatever. And, um, you know, just have a little discussion about why he keep coming over there. He going to have to start charging him, just ribbing him and whatever, just playing with him and all that. But once again, I do love that relationship that's developing between them two. Um... And, you know, Brandon told him, you know, what you doing this for? Trying to get a little girl, the little homework girl that you helping out or whatever. It was like, I mean, she cool or whatever. You know, sometimes my friends don't like her or whatever, but it is what it is. And it was like, you know, um, don't pay no attention to your friends because your friends will have you marrying a stripper. Okay, don't, don't, don't fuck around with that, you know. So that was a cute little scene. Moving on from that, let's just get into the heart of the episode. So Brandon... <sighs> We just going we let me get Emmett little stuff out the way. Emmett is trying to figure out who is occupying Keisha time if it ain't him, okay? Because as he was telling Brandon, he brought her some track shoes or whatever. And, you know, um, he was like, yeah, she must be talking to somebody because she ain't talked to me. She ain't returning to my text or whatever. And it's been a week and all this. And it was like, you know, we got this kind of rule. Just because we're not together, you still get to cut. And, you know, um, you're not supposed to get in your feelings over another man's dude or whatever. But technically speaking, Emmett, you're getting in your feelings, okay? Because this girl hasn't called you back. You haven't heard from him. You don't know what's going on. He goes down there to see um, um, Kevin at his school. Kevin trying to figure out what the hell he doing there. And so at this point... He realizes that, you know, because Kevin was telling him, hey, you got this nice car and all this stuff, the BMW, and it's this color, it's that color. And he was like, look, man, that ain't my car. He was like, well, who car is it? Because that's who she's been sneaking out with. So this gives Emmy some information. So he's going around trying to see who it is, and he finds the car. And then the track coach comes out and, you know, asking him, is he a student? Because Emmett looked real creepy, like he was really finna steal that car or whatever, admiring it and everything. And um, he was like, you small, but you look like you can run. If you want to try for the team, come let us know and all this stuff. And I'm just sitting here like, bitch, Emmett put two and two together, baby. That's the car. That's the man. That's a grown-ass man. You heard what Emmett said, so you like young or something like that. Bitch. I just want to know how Keisha and this track coach got together and how is he making all this money that he can, um, what, what's his salary that he making in the Chicago public school system that he got a BMW and he just a track coach. Okay. What? And it look, and he keeps it up to date. You know what I'm saying? So moving on from that, we got that out the way. Um, this whole thing with Ronnie and Jada, baby, baby, did we see these coming? I didn't necessarily see it coming, but I kind of, kind of felt it. I literally kind of, kind of felt it a little bit because hey, it was getting a little bit close. Okay, she helping him out, trying to get him a little bit of job on the side here and there. And then, you know, um, being there for him when he found out who his father was, you know, being there with his grandmother. So, of course, some feelings going to develop. She was there trying to help him out through his little struggles and stuff. You know, after trying to figure out what's going on with Ronnie because... He been outside playing with that car, trying to get the car to work all this time. And so, you know, um, she was up there trying to talk to him. And it was good in a sense that Ronnie does now have somebody to talk to because when he came out of jail, regardless of what it was, you know, how I may feel about it, like he should still be in jail. But he has somebody other than um, Common to talk to. And, you know, um, that's going to show some interest in him and making him feel like a human being again. And that's exactly what Jada is giving him. And, you know, everybody needs somebody to talk to, especially when you dealt with trauma. And I love the fact that when they were sitting down on their couch and, 
uh, they was having that little conversation and she was talking about generational trauma and cycles that we need to break. You know, she was saying how her mother was a single mother and then look at what she did. She went out and became a single mother and now her father, her, her son is out here as technically a single dad. You know what I'm saying? So it's a generational curse that you need to finish, um, you know, stop in the tracks up. Somebody needs to come forth and just put a halt to it. And, you know, next thing you know, <laughs> he was trying to get that kind of work and, you know, she was, um, they talking about Ethel and how come you didn't confront her. You need to tell her what's going on because she can sense that something ain't right with you, that you mad with her or something, you know. And he was like, that's how she always been and all that stuff. What a, what a, what a. Okay. Next thing you know, they kiss. He kissed her and she didn't resist that shit. I said, mm. Uh, okay, I don't know how I feel about this because Ryan, I like Jada and she gonna still be seeing him. Like, you know, they was bonding over the fact that he had to get some stuff, some baby stuff or whatever for his grandchild because, you know, Jason really wasn't his child, but, you know, he took on as the parental figure, father figure in his life. But my whole thing is, Mm, what's gonna happen with Tracy? Okay, so you didn't push Tracy to the side. I mean, Tracy still needs to get herself together as well. She's grieving, so you know she's in no good shape to be in a relationship with anybody at this point. She needs to, you know, figure herself out first. But how is this gonna work? Ronnie ain't got no job. Okay, maybe Jada gonna be there to actually, you know, coast him to get a job and be there to, you know, help him get that help that he need mentally and, you know, physically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> physically, bang, 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 <laughs> bang, 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 ski, 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 bang, 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 ski, ski, ski. If you from Chicago, you know that shit, bitch. Um. Anyway, I was just like, okay, I didn't see this coming a little bit, but. I don't know how I feel about it, but if it works, it works. It's just that because Ronnie has a history of going off the deep end and becoming, you know, in so many words, a bum. You know what I'm saying? Um, he wasn't doing nothing. We don't want him to relapse. And what if something happened else happened that make him relapse into being an alcoholic again and being out there on the street, can't find a job and all that stuff. Mind you, he still, I don't know if that's on his record that he was in jail was his um record expunged, but... We don't know, but we'll figure that out. We'll see how that roll. Y'all tell me how y'all feel about Jada and Ronnie together. Did y'all see that coming? Because I didn't. I didn't. But moving on from that, um, what else happened in this episode? Two more things happened. Okay, so we got Brandon. Brandon is out here doing his thing on a truck, and I'm going to have to put these two together because they kind of, you know, interject with each other. Brandon out here doing what he had to do with his truck and, um, you know, he's so surprised and so happy about the new stove that he got. He's trying to show Jerrica, girl, the whole time I'm looking at this episode like, damn, Jason, damn it, Jason, fuck, you know what I'm saying? They really was acting their ass off because you could not tell that it was tension going on between them two, bitch, but we'll get off of that. Um, I spoke about that in the way it is. If you want to know, go watch that. But anyway, Brandon is excited about his, um, you know, stove and all that stuff. She's supposed to, they supposed to be having dinner with, um, Tiffany's parents, or I should say Jerrica's parents. And, um, at one point, Brandon was out there with Emmett doing some stuff and he went to go withdraw some money from the bank. And on the receipt, it had like $52,000. That was the balance. And he was like, wait a minute, bitch. Him and Emmett looking like, where is money coming from? Now, at this point, Emmett is um, the devil on his shoulder saying, keep that shit, bitch. Okay, I was uh, working at the mall when I was a kid, when I was in uh, high school. And they fired me and they still was giving me a check for two, one, two months. They was giving me a check before they stopped that shit. I went and brought me two pairs of joys. I said, such a young man. But, um, you know, he was just telling him to keep that shit. Brandon, on the other hand, is like, I need to, um, you know, talk to Mr. Perry to see what's going on because I don't want him thinking that somebody stole his money or I didn't took his money on purpose and all this stuff, whatever. And then he get a uh, uh, knock on the door from one of Mr. Perry's associates giving him a whole new truck. A whole new food truck. And so at this point, down at the police station, you got Tucson that was out there looking at Brandon because now 
this is the fish that old boy in the jail told them to give to Tucson. And they're setting it up so nicely to make it seem as if Brendan is a part of this whole organization now. Tucson is noticing a lot of things. While she is watching and observing them, she's taking pictures. And she's noticing that Reg, because remember, Reg took that food from him, first of all, without even paying. Now, all of a sudden, we see in the pictures that Reg is paying him. Paying him to do this, paying him to do that, okay? And she's trying to understand how is that possible when the 63rd Street mob, anybody that's around there, they basically, you know, um, shake them down. You got to give them money and all this stuff, and you got to give them free stuff and all this. And that's not happening with Brandon. People are walking around him like they're bodyguards. They're watching him and following him and all this stuff. So now she's getting in her mind that he has to be a part of the 63 um, 3rd Street mob, you know. And, you know, she was telling this to Cruz. Cruz was like, no, nah, I don't believe that shit. He's not that type of person that do nothing. And, you know, her whole thing is, what is it with you and this bleeding heart for the black man and all this shit? And it irks me when she says stuff like that. And... Because it's like she's a black woman that lost faith in, you know, her own black men. And it's like, I know we got some game bangers out there and all that stuff, but not everybody that is every black man is a thug or a game member or something like that. And so, you know, there, and it goes to show that not every cop is a bad cop. But see, Cruz got his own past and we'll get on to that. Um, and it kind of made me mad, but you know, it is what it is. And so, she was trying to figure out some stuff with that. And at that point, you know, um, Cruz wanted to get, uh, wanted to get in contact with Brandon and let him know. Not necessarily let him know, but try to feel him out what's going on. Because the evidence is kind of pointing towards him being involved with this thir uh, 63rd Street gang. And he technically is, but he don't know it. He don't know it. He was just thrown in there because not only do... It, Perry is giving him all this stuff. He even had to go over there to talk to Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry told him to raise your um expectations, bro. Okay, you know, you are a chef. Don't make yourself just think like you're just a chef. You're a business person yourself. You know, you got to get out here and seize life by the horns, okay? You got to believe in yourself and put yourself first, okay? That's what you need to do. He said, when I got fired from this job or whatever... I went out and got me a Mercedes. When I didn't get the promotion or something that I should have got, I went out and put a down payment on my house because I had more faith in me. You need to live by faith and you need to have more faith. I said, that's all well and good, but bitch, a bitch can go into debt, okay? Because he said, I bet on myself and you need to do the same thing. Mind you, him and Jerrica went over there to, um, him and Jerrica went over there to his mom's, to her parents' house. And they was having a discussion. They were really proud of her and the work that she was doing with Miss Brown and the company. And they want to give her some more responsibilities because they're thinking about retiring soon. Okay. And so this is all good. But Jerrica is feeling some type of way because she wants to, you know, um, she had a conversation earlier with her friend, Drunk Courtney, you know, about getting more low income people into these housing and how they do and certain, you know, condos and all that stuff they do um, set aside a certain amount for low income people. And I've noticed that because in a place where I work at, I work in the West Loop and there have been a couple of people, a few people that come in and I know for sure um, that. If you go to the West Loop out here in Chicago, that's a rich city, okay? That's that's upper middle class mid, of a uh upper class city right there. Okay. Condos and apartments start like um two hundred two thousand five hundred dollars just for a fucking studio. Okay? Ain't nobody got time for that. And so you look at certain people and you could tell and you know you shouldn't judge, but you can tell their income status or whatever that they don't have it like that, but yet they live in an address down in their neighborhood. Because they have it blocked off that certain in lower income people can't get into some of these buildings and stuff like that. And so I've seen that and I get where she's coming from and she wants to do more. After all the stuff that's been happening, you know, she's looking at these letters people been putting it, bringing in about, you know, how um, they getting pushed out of certain things. They can't get into this because there isn't any more and all this stuff and their woes and their, you know, struggles. And she's feeling really bad. She has a bleeding heart for them. OK, and she's telling her parents she wants to do more. She wants to, you know, open up the um, condominiums 10 percent more than what they're doing and let some more income people, low income people come 
come in. And you can tell, you know, now it's like the fact that they're in this position of being able to provide for people and they're like this well-off-to-do black couple and black people in this upper echelon of stuff in society it makes them uncomfortable talking about those who are struggling. They don't want to talk about that. They don't want to mention that because they went on ahead and tried to change the subject and said, we'll talk about this sometime later. Let's just enjoy the food. Girl, I hate when people do that, but, you know, that's just how it is these days sometimes. And it's been like that forever. Um, but um, she wanted to do something, and and she had talked to this lady who she wanted to help and the lady was just like, she was telling, the lady was so excited. She was so excited to be down there. She thinking she got a place. She been looking for a place, been on the list for a place. And only for Jerrica to tell her, no, there isn't nothing open available. Here's a number that you can call. I talked to this person. I talked to that person. And the, 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 the look on her face when she found this information out, like, you really had me come all the way down here just to tell me no and to give me a number to something that I probably already got. Okay, I take three buses just to go to work early in the morning. And then I walk the rest of the way so I can be there because I need to be home so that I can get my daughter on time from um, daycare because if I'm late get picking her up they charge me $25 and I would leave the bitch but that's the only daycare that sh uh, is a low rate she's cheap okay as, as it is you know compared to the other ones you know so I felt bad for that lady and that made her feel real bad to the point where when Brandon found out about the food truck getting a new food truck he wanted to come home and tell her about what happened but she just broke down crying and told him what was going on and how she feels bad and how she hates her job and she out here doing everything for her parents and Miss Brown and everybody else. But it's like, what does Jerrica want? Okay, she's not following what Jerrica want. And at this point, Brandon told her to quit. She said, no, baby, I can't quit because I have to keep us afloat. You know, we got bills to pay. We got money. We need money and all this stuff. He was like, that's not your responsibility, okay? I should do that. You know, let me do this, okay? You can depend on me. And what was fucking me up about this whole conversation is the fact that, you know, even Emmett was saying you could buy her a ring and all this shit. You know, um, he did go down there. We'll get on that in a second. That whole conversation made me feel a type of way because... They were speaking as if they were already married, okay? We got bills to pay. We be buddy. Depend on me and all this stuff. Bitch, you ain't my husband. You ain't my wife. I'm not about to depend on you because anything can happen where we can break up and we both going to be assed out. Girl, I said, nigga, go ahead and put that ring on her finger, okay? Because she's showing you that she's there for the long run, all right? So he goes down to a bar and he's talking to his stepdaddy and, um... You know, talking about getting the ring and then start talking about Otis Perry. And he was like, Otis, do that? Do that, nigga? They call him do that in the streets. I grew up with this man. This boy got into it with some um kid in the, um, you know, the uh, 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 own schoolyard, busted their ass up and went back to playing like ain't shit happened. He's a snake. He's shady. He's a hustler. He's a whole nother breed, okay? Y'all need to fuck with that nigga. All right, so we get that. Jerrica Duel eventually says that she, um, you know, um, quit her job, okay? And so we're going to see how that goes, you know, now that Jerrica quit her job. He going to have to stay in there with Otis. And Otis and Duda, he is not going to be playing with that ass. You saw the preview for next week? Baby, he is not going to be playing with that ass, okay? All shits is all, you know, all the pretenses off is Duda. It's no more Mr. Um, Perry. It's Duda now, okay? And so, um, at this point, we're going to go over here and talk about Cruz. Baby, Cruz, Cruz, Cruz. Cruz comes from Missouri. I think it said Kansas City, Missouri, and I think it started out, first of all, oh, 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 the white bitch, okay, the white bitch that was going around with the realty, you know, realty, um, um, trying to get the people out their homes and stuff and was coming to Miss Ethel, bitch, they found her in her car with a bullet in her head, and they was contrasting that with the, um, fact that in 2000, I think 13 or 12, you know, up in Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri, that's where, um, Cruz first was started at, and, he 
caught a case that his partner did shooting a black man, an unarmed black man that he claimed he thought he had a gun. They checked the car and there was no gun. He was reaching for his seatbelt, trying to get the license and registrations and shit, trying to get out the car. That's it. Okay. And of course, all of a sudden, and he's Puerto Rican. Okay. He's Puerto Rican, both of them. And so now it went from being, you know, <laughs> It was an accident and I'm your brother to, you know, fuck them, uh, basically a slur for black folks, okay, and when, um, Cruz called him a coconut, because he was like, oh, so you a coconut, um, you know, brown on the outside, white on the inside, because now he made it so that, um, at first, they're all saying that nothing happened, he accidentally did this shit, you know, he, there was nothing on this man, but then in the report, you put in there that he lunged at him and all this stuff. He still had the seatbelt on, so how can he lunge at you, you know? And so he wanted him to sign off on that. That's when he called him that coconut and all that stuff. They they put my number out here. They did this and they did that. And so, you know, you need to um protect me. I'm your brother and all this shit. Woo, woo, woo. And so at this point, he really wasn't thinking about Cruz is the one that wanted to do it by the book. Mind you, Cruz got taken off the case um, that they was going to do. Tucson was doing, um, I think, with the realty. That was getting taken off the case and whatever because of the judgment that came down. He's on the desk duty because of the whole thing with Ryan. Okay. And so at this point, you know, back in 2012 when this shooting happened, basically his partner wanted him to cover it up. And then he got worried around in the um, police department that he was thinking not to. And they was icing him out, put a bullet in his locker, uh, in his mailbox, called him a nigga lover. And I said, ain't this about a bitch? That's so messed up. And then, you know, it was all about brothers in blue first okay not about justice not about being right i hate that i hate that we see in a lot of these organizations that goes on that people will protect their own before they give them up even though they've done something wrong they will protect them you see that in fraternities you see that in the police department you see that in a whole bunch of these um um type of uh, uh group coming together okay they will protect their own and not call them out on their bullshit and what they do. And it's sad. And I'm not saying all of them do, but most of them, okay? And the way that they ice them out, I'm pretty sure that's what really happens, okay? And, um, you know, he eventually succumbed to the pressure and decided to go with what they said and said that he was protecting him and all this stuff or whatever at that press conference. And then you heard that he said, my brown brother in blue, you know? And I was just looking at Cruz, like, see, and I guess that's the reason why he had to leave. Like, listen, I can't fuck with you no more because you put me in this compromising position. But, and, and I hate that they put the good cops in positions like this where if they tell, they going to put that, you know, they're going to circulate that around the whole police department, wherever they go. Or that's going to be a badge on you, uh, a stain on you that you told on your brother in blue. Well, your brother in blue shouldn't have did the shit. Okay. And that's what's called being a good cop when you can stand up to motherfuckers. That's what it is. So Cruz, he had me looking at him sideways. Okay. But I understood it. And I still wasn't here for it because, you know, he wasn't ready to suffer the consequences. He wasn't ready for the backlash. He wasn't ready for people to hate him. He would rather have, you know, people out there in the world to hate him. Um, these innocent folks that got affected by this to hate him. than have his own people, the brothers in blue, and not be able to get a job elsewhere to hate him. And um, not feel that they can trust him or whatever because he's snitching on fellow officers. Well, the fellow officers shouldn't have fucked up. Okay, that's how I feel about that. But we'll see. Um, what else happened in this episode? Baby, we find out that Tucson got a son. And not only do she got a son, a son who was a gang member who got into some trouble with the lead, the leader of the gang member that she killed. Okay? And he went to jail for for whatever reason. And now because of all of that shit, he don't have no protection in jail. And so he got to get money from her so that he can get some little protection. Because she was like, you got to put this money on my book because the gangs ain't um, protecting me. They know who the fuck you are. And they know what the fuck I did. So, you know... Uh, it's hell. Cause she was like, are you making friends in there, baby? I said friends in jail. <laughs> this ain't jail bus. <laughs> I gotta watch that. That shit been circulating over Twitter. I have to watch it. That's gonna be the next thing I watch. 
fake. Yeah, I was like, wow, Tucson, you got a story to tell. You look like the type that'll do some crooked shit. Like, she been doing crooked shit all this time, busting in that house and taking the money. She said she working on something. So, hmm, no wonder why she sat there and looked at that money when they busted into that stash house like that. I was like, oh, girl, oh, girl, the shit mamas would do for their kids, okay? But, um, yeah, that was, um, did I miss anything? That was the episode. That was the episode. Y'all tell me how y'all feel about it, and I will see you guys later. Peace.